everyone, and welcome to the Clear Gun Show. I'm your host, Dr. G, with a PhD, and we are back. Now, before we get started, if you guys like what you hear and you like what you see, just like and subscribe and tell all your friends, and let's get this show as big as possible. A couple of housekeeping things before the show gets on the road, and I'm just going to let you guys know a little bit about what's going to go on with the show. So it's because of work and you know several other things going on. It's going to be, for now, a once-a-week show, and the episodes will usually drop sometime either Friday or Saturday. At least, that's the plan for now. I am also looking into making this show a video production instead of you know an audio production with sound clips. Um, and so that's taking a little longer than I thought. I was hoping to have it ready by this episode, but I think it's going to take, at the very least, a few weeks, maybe a couple of months. There just happens to be a lot of moving parts, and I want to get it to a state of quality that I think is good enough for the audience and for you guys. So we're working on that in the background, but for now, let's get to the show. So we've got two big things to talk about today. The first one is going to be monkeypox. I'm going to give you guys a history lesson on poxes. We're going to talk about monkeypox cases. We're going to go over the literature that's out there right now. And I'm going to try and inform you guys to the best of my knowledge about what is going on. And this way you guys have all the sources to talk about it with your friends and family and anyone else that's concerned in the community because that's what's most important. Let's get the information out there. So we'll do monkeypox first. Then I'm going to go over COVID. A lot has happened in COVID recently. And there's a lot to think about in terms of leadership and what's going on. So I'm going to break down some things happening in COVID and a little bit of vindication for the show. We called quite a few things in the in the last months that I was on, and uh, a lot of those came true. So we're going to talk about a few of them. Uh, after COVID, after monkeypox, we're going to go over a few smaller stories. One in particular that I've enjoyed reading about is the Earth spinning a little bit faster than normal, and people are getting uh, climate anxiety from this. We'll talk about that. Also, a story that has been bugging me, literally and figuratively, uh, for a few weeks now, and I'm finally going to talk about it here on the show for this first episode, and that's this obsession that's creeping into the news cycles, into the news stations, into the online newspapers about bugs and eating them specifically for climate change purposes. So we'll talk about that and much, much more on today's show. All right, on to monkeypox. Now, before we specifically dive into monkeypox at present day, I want to give you guys some context with a little bit of history about pox virus in general, a little bit about smallpox, a little bit about vaccination, and then we'll get right into monkeypox. So first of all, here is the cladogram of pox viridae, which is the overarching family of pox viruses. And you can see it took three pages on the screen to, to get them all together. There's a whole bunch of them. Now, the classification that we're most interested in are the orthopox viruses, and that contains cowpox, monkeypox, variola virus, and variola is the scientific name for smallpox, which we'll talk about right now. So smallpox is one of the most famous, or I should say infamous, diseases in human history. It has a mortality rate of 30%, and that's, by the way, variola major. There's major and there's minor. The minor has a less than 1% fatality. The major is the one that everyone talks about and history remembers not so fondly as just wiping out populations. Among children younger than one, smallpox had a fatality rate of 40 to 50%, which is crazy. One of the more insidious things about smallpox was the transmission. It can be transmitted through a number of routes. So a common route might be you have somebody infected with smallpox and they get these pustules and they are coughing and breathing on these blankets and these pillowcases, and then someone else lays down in that bed, they get smallpox. Along with surviving on blankets and pillowcases and clothing of individuals that are infected, it can also be transmitted just through airborne droplets, or respiratory droplets, so a very transmissible disease. It's pretty clear that high transmissibility and high fatality are not a good combination for the livelihood of humans. And in 1796, one particular human made an interesting observation that paved the way for vaccination. That guy's name was Edward Jenner. And Edward Jenner observed in 1796 that the milkmaids who had cowpox were protected from smallpox. It's important to remember this was before the real modern germ theory that we understand today was popularized. What was well known at the time was this process called variolation. And variolation was the idea that you could kind of infect someone, although they didn't have these terms at the time, you could infect somebody with a mild disease 
and then they'd be protected against a more severe disease. That was the general idea. The mechanism, again, was not known to these, to these folks. So Jenner runs an experiment. Now this kind of experiment you could not do today. I repeat, there is no possible way you could do this today, at least through government funded research. Maybe some guy in the backwoods could do something, but this is not a standard practice today. He, what he did was he took a swab of cowpox from the milkmaid Sarah Nelms. She took it, he took it from her hand. He then inoculated a sample of that smallpox, or sorry, of that cowpox into the arm of James Phipps, who was nine years old at the time, and he was a son of one of the gardeners. A few months after the initial exposure of the, of the cowpox, Jenner would expose James to smallpox multiple times, and James never succumbed to smallpox. So Jenner published his results in 1801, and the title of that publication was On the Origin of the Vaccine Inoculation. Jenner was quoted as saying, The annihilation of the smallpox, the most dreadful scourge of the human species, must be the final result of this practice. End quote. That practice being vaccination. So fast forward to more modern day. The last naturally occurring case of smallpox was in October of 1977, and the World Health Assembly declared smallpox eradicated in 1980. That eradication, by the way, came about through vaccination, and they weren't using uh, what Jenner was using in 1796. They had much more modern therapeutics, but the end result came from a vaccine campaign, a global vaccine campaign. All right, so with that brief history of poxes and vaccination of poxes, we're going to go to monkeypox. And real quick before we go to monkeypox, if you're wondering about chickenpox, well, chickenpox isn't actually in pox viridae. Chickenpox is a herpes virus, so we're not going to talk about it. So a brief history on the monkeypox virus specifically. It was discovered in 1958 in laboratory monkeys that came from Africa. Along with the monkeys, there was numerous African rodents discovered to be hosts of the virus. These animals were found to be endemic to countries of Central and Western Africa. The first report of monkeypox in humans came around in the late 1970s in remote African locations. Between 1981 and 1987, there was 37 documented cases reported in the Democratic Republic of Congo. The largest outbreak prior to this year occurred between 1996 and 1997 in Africa, and the case fatality of that outbreak was 3.3%. The last major outbreak in the U.S. was in May to June of 2003, and we had 72 confirmed or suspected cases. And this was in the upper mid part of the country, so yeah, Illinois, that area. Um, and they began with a three-year-old that was bitten by a prairie dog from Africa as part of the exotic pet trade. So what are the signs and symptoms of monkeypox? Well, they're very similar to smallpox, uh, but much milder. So you get the fevers, the headaches, muscle aches back pain, you get the swollen lymph nodes. Uh, within one to three days of the fever, you get a very unique rash and you get these pustules that, are, that, that have become characteristic of the pox diseases. Let's go ahead and take a look at some of the numbers around the world. In the U.S., there are 10,768 confirmed cases as of last week. Uh, the top five states for cases are New York with 2,187, California 1,892, Florida, 1,053, Georgia, 824, and Texas, 815. Again, as of last week. Cumulative cases from around the world, this coming from our world in data, is in between 30,000 and 35,000 cases. Um, as far as deaths, at first I tried to do a, you know, a seven-day rolling average of deaths, kind of like COVID, but the results came back really weird because there's been so few deaths. So I had to do cumulative confirmed cases. And the total number of deaths from around the world since the beginning of this outbreak are 10. The vast majority in Africa, with none in the U.S., according to CBS, August, as of August 11th. So why are we talking about this disease? Um, what, what's particularly unique about it? You know, very few people are dying. Um, it seems to be relatively self-limiting. So that means you get it, you write it out, then you're good to go. Um, we're talking about it because it has become extremely politicized and it's it's been very difficult to get um, just, you know, a, a, a neutral read on the case without people getting inflammatory. And why is that? Because the population that is particularly impacted by this disease is the gay men population. We're going to show this through three different studies, one from the UK, one from the US, and one published in the New England Medical Journal. Um, they all say effectively the same thing. And to be clear, the virus doesn't have its own 
you know, mental faculties. It's not saying I'm going to target gay people and then it targets gay people. No, it's that the population that the virus is spreading around in right now happens to be the gay male population by a wide margin. So it's not a gay disease. It is a disease in the gay community right now. So we'll start things off with a study from the UK Health Security Agency. And this study was updated August 5th of this year, 2022. So originally on June 10th, they had surveyed 152 monkeypox patients. 151 were men who had sex with men, according to the study. They performed an epi study, an epidemiological study, uh, 336 cases in the UK. Where sex was available in the study, 311 out of 314, which is over 99% were male, and the other three were female. Again, where sex was available in the study. They were then able to interview in much more detail 45 patients, so a small sample size. But again, you know, globally there's 30,000 cases. Um, we went through the cases in the U.S. You know, it was 1,000 in one state, 800 in another state. So 45 was a sample size that they were able to get in the U.K. And from there, they were able to extrapolate several findings. 98% of those interviewed reported sex with other men during the incubation period. 44% had more than 10 sexual partners in the last three months. 44% had group sex during incubation period. 64% met new partners through dating apps during the incubation period. And 60% had STDs within the previous year. Again, this is all important information when it comes to treatment. When, when doctors need to know a generalized look at who's getting sick with what, and it helps you know, facilitate treatment, get resources. So this is all important to know. So let's go to the U.S. and see how the U.S. numbers and the U.S. data compares to the British data. So we're taking this study from a CDC MMRW, uh, and it's from August 5th. This study was in over 1,000 participants. 99% of the cases in the study were male. 94% uh, in this study reported having male-to-male -male sexual or close intimate contact three weeks before symptom onset. 41% of those that were available for further questioning were HIV positive. In the CDC's own words, and I echo this sentiment, and I think this is what all the data show, that treatment and um, focus needs to be prioritized in the gay community. That's where this is, that's, where, that's who's getting hurt by this right now. So we need to focus treatment to this and focus messaging that way as well. The final study we're gonna take a look at regarding monkeypox is from the New England Medical Journal, and this was published on July 21st. And the study spanned 16 countries uh, from April uh, 27th, 2022 till June 24th, 2022. So more specifically, this study looked at 528 infections across 43 sites and like I said originally, across 16 countries. 98% of those in the study were gay or bisexual men. 41% were living with HIV infection. Uh, of those 41%, 96% are taking ART currently, which is antiretroviral therapy, which is the the most common therapy for uh, HIV right now, or, or one of the more successful ones at least. And then 95% of those had an HIV viral load of less than 50 copies per milliliter. So the reason that number is important is because most of the common testing for HIV uh, particle load, the detection, uh, the lowest detection limit is 50 uh, copies per million. So if you're below that, you're considered undetectable. And uh, patients that have HIV that have an undetectable count, uh, particle count, or uh, sorry, particle copy counts are tend to not spread HIV as easily, um, if at all in some cases, compared to those that have a high viral load. In a lot of ways, this current iteration of monkeypox is behaving like an STD, and the New England Medical Journal agrees with that sentiment. Some of their analyses suggest that the virus has been circulating undetected for some time outside, uh, for some time outside areas where it has been endemic, possibly masquerading as other STDs or STIs. Here's another sentence from the New England Medical Journal. The suspected means of monkeypox virus transmission as reported by the, by, the, by the clinician was sexual close contact in 95% of persons. It was not possible yet to confirm sexual transmission. This is a little confusing, but what I think they mean is, is a majority of the, of the people that contracted monkeypox did have sexual contact. But what they're saying here is, is that they can't, I don't think, yet confirm precisely the mechanism of transmission if sex was it. A lot of signs are indicating so, but it might not be the only way to get it. Similarly with a lot of STDs, sex isn't the only way to get those STDs. 
It just happens to be by far and away the most common way that you succumb to that STD. Uh, final sentence from the New England Medical Journal that I'm going to quote, and this comes from the discussion uh, discussion section of the paper. Sexual activity largely among gay or bisexual men was by far the most frequently suspected route of transmission. The strong likelihood of sexual transmission was supported by the findings of primary genital, anal, and oral mucosal lesions, which may represent the inoculation site. Actually, real quick, there's one more quote that I would just I just can't help myself because this is kind of hilarious that they that they mentioned this. But they say that, uh, you know, they're, they're trying to discover or, or hypothesize why, why this outbreak might be happening right now. And one of the reasons they give was the relaxation of coronavirus disease uh, prevention measures. So I'm just going to say no, that that was not it. Um, they, uh, of course, when you relax, keeping everyone in their house for a while, disease is going to spread out. But this particular disease is so focused and concentrated right now. I don't think it has anything to do with the relaxation of COVID-19 prevention measures, mostly because then we would see it much more equally distributed. If it was just the fact that people that were in their houses at one point or not going out much, and then all of a sudden went out, you would expect a much more even distribution. Uh, but this is not evenly distributed. So now that we have some data, we can actually make some risk assessment measures and we can, we can really, you know, we can, we can learn how to live our lives with diseases. Uh, and in this case, there's a lot of a lot of good news for everybody. Number one, it doesn't seem to transmit that easily. Even if it is the case that it can can transmit through respiratory droplets, it seems to be the case that you have to really get a, a high volume of droplets um, to, to contract the disease. Number two, people are not dying from it in large numbers at all, especially in America and Europe. Very few people are dying from this disease. I think the number was 10 or, or 12 at at, at, uh, at last count among thousands and thousands of cases. So that's good news. If you're a family and uh, you're concerned about your kids getting monkeypox from school, I there's no data to support that that is happening at all. And I, I wouldn't be concerned about it. As a matter of fact, there are very few cases confirmed of uh, childhood monkeypox in the U.S. And in all the cases that I've read that there is a confirmation, the adults in that family had monkeypox, so they didn't get it from the school, uh, as far as I can tell. But, of course, as with a lot of things that happen these days, this thing spiraled out of control, and uh, New York declared monkeypox a public health emergency, then San Francisco declared monkeypox a public health emergency, then finally, uh, HHS Secretary Becerra declared monkeypox a U.S. health emergency. In light of all of these developments, uh, and the evolving circumstances on the ground. I want to make an announcement today that I will be declaring a public health emergency on monkeypox. And that was on August 4th of this year. In San Francisco on July 28th, they deemed monkeypox a public health emergency. Ostensibly, one does this to get resources, to try and acquire vaccines, uh, more focus to a particular area, to ramp up epidemiological services, to do case tracing, a whole bunch of stuff goes on when you do a public health emergency. Now, just like there's different kinds of natural disasters, there's hurricanes, there's tornadoes, there's earthquakes, uh, not all public health emergencies, in my opinion, should be treated the same. We should be as surgical as possible. The data, for example, on COVID, before it ever hit U.S. shores, it showed a very particular population that was being impacted severely, and we could have acted much more surgically in that situation. Likewise, in San Francisco, monkeypox is a surgical situation. We can be very precise in helping and really helping the population that's being impacted. When you make things a general statement or when you make them too broad, you dilute the resources to a whole bunch of populations that really aren't going to take advantage of them. So in, the, in San Francisco's case, what they should have done is said, OK, if we're going to make it a public health emergency, which they did, then our actions from the public health emergency should be directed to protecting this population. Now, public health officials can make recommendations, and I'm not saying you should. You have to follow a recommendation. I think people are free agents. They can, you know, they can look at things and make their own risk assessment. But from all that we know about monkeypox, we know where it's transmitting the most. We know the kind of contact that is spreading it the most. We know between who, generally speaking, right now, it's spreading between the most. Now, I think a, a, a relatively benign public health intervention would say it would be, okay, look, if you have monkeypox, hang out at home, 
let it ride its course, don't go out. That's one thing. And I'm sure people were saying that. Number two, and this one for some reason people have a big problem with, but the a way to totally pr- prevent having any monkeypox is being abstinent for a little while, right? If, if everybody was abstinent for a little while, uh, for three weeks, there were, the cases would drop next to nothing, and then you can resume your normal activities. It's a very, it's so self-limiting. It's, it's, it's an easy solution. Everybody hates that because they don't like being told what to do. And again, I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just saying if you 100% don't want monkeypox and it matters that much to you, well, then don't do the activity right now that is leading to so many cases. And it's, it's that simple. But back to San Francisco real quickly. What do they do? Uh, three days later on July 31st, they hold the Dory Alley event, which is one of the larger fetish festivals in San Francisco. And this attracts many uh, people that are suscept- that are right now in the community that monkeypox is really impacting. So my question is, why make it a public health emergency? What was the point of that? If you were just going to do all the behaviors we're going to do anyways, what's the point of that? Um, I think it really dilutes the statement public health emergency. Um, and coming off the heels of COVID, it's, good, it's making it less and less likely that people take public health officials seriously. And at this point, maybe they shouldn't. Again, I think people are free agents. You can look at your options. You can make your own risk assessments. But seriously, what is the purpose of making a public health emergency with a disease where we know the community that the disease is spreading in? And then the next day or the next within the next three days, you do a, a very large festival for that particular community that encourages the particular behaviors that are spreading this disease. It just doesn't make any sense to me. And then again, of course, I wouldn't have deemed monkeypox a public health emergency. Um, But that's just me. They're being way too flippant with the public health emergency status these days. One of these days, a wolf is going to come, you know. There's going to be a highly communicable disease. It's going to be relatively fatal. And uh, at that time, people should, you know, be able to make their own risk assessments like they always have been. And who are they going to use to get their knowledge to make that risk assessment from? The public health people right now? These are the people that are diluting all these terms. And it's, it's, it's not good. It's not going to be pretty. And, it, you know, it's a, it's a you know, reap what you sow situation, unfortunately. This shouldn't be a public health emergency. They're calling it one. They've made it one. They should act like it's one. And they aren't. And that's going to do it for the monkeypox wrap-up from this show. Um, if more pressing news comes out in the coming weeks, we'll keep you guys posted on it. My prediction is that it's mostly going to die down and fizzle out into nothing um, just because the way this disease is behaving uh, at an epidemiological scale. That's just my guess. Uh, but because this segment took so long, I'm actually going to come back the following day with the COVID segment I was going to do. And then depending on how long that is, I might do one more third little episode on all the other fun stories. Uh, but again, it's going to typically be a once a week show. It's just this week I had a lot to do on these on this first episode, so it ended up this way. Thank you guys for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed our return to the airwaves. Uh, I will be taking questions in the comment section. Um, so if you guys have some questions that you want me to address, I'll be answering them on Friday. Also, uh, comment on topics you want to hear about. I'd like to do sections that involve involve what you guys are interested in. Of course, I'll do a lot of things that I'm interested in. And again, looking forward to enjoying all the news and all the science and the policy with you guys. Have a great day. Enjoy this video. Talk to you soon. Puff giving my BFA shovel. Peasant! What did you call me? Babe, stop embarrassing me for my friends. Call me peasant. Well, you're kind of being...